We'll call this meeting to order. Let the record reflect that all five commissioners are here. And we'll move on to opening public comment. Public comment cards and comments left on the county's website prior. Oops, forgot the Pledge of Allegiance. Before I do that, we'll call for the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Nelson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Commissioner Nelson. I appreciate that. We'll move on to public comment. I was so anxious to get there. Public comment cards and comments left at the county's website prior to the board meeting have been compiled and made a part of the supporting materials that have been provided to the county commissioners and public for review. Only two periods of public comment will be taken during this meeting, once at the beginning of the board meeting and again at the end of the meeting. Public comment will not be taken on each agenda item. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person once a public comment period has been opened. Public comment will be heard in person or by leaving a voice message on Douglas County's public comment phone line 775-783-6007. In the person in person public comment will be heard first, then voice messages will be played to the public and county commissioners in the order that they were recorded. No more than one voice message public comment per person will be played during each public comment period. Public comment will remain open for at least five minutes to allow members of the public to call or until the last caller has finished leaving a voice message on the county's public comment phone line. The board wants to encourage a respectful consideration of all views by members of the public. At this time, public comment will be taken on those items that are within the jurisdiction and control of the Board of Commissioners. Is there anybody on uh, the call that would like to make public comment? Hearing none, I'll go to the phone. Ms. Poole, is there any public comment? Amy Poole, for the record, yes, we have multiple. I will start playing them. Okay. Lynn Muzzy, M-U-Z-Z-Y. Looking back on this Board of County Commissioners meetings, I see a pattern of the DA's legal counsel appearing to provide cover for this board majority's predetermined positions particularly when they have acted against the best interests of their constituents. For example, it's been clear for a long time that voters in significant numbers saw a Park 2500 as detrimental to their community, dumping thousands of new car trips onto an already congested 395, covering permeable ag land, which the master plan was supposed to prevent, and a much promised four lane Muller bypass, which this board replaced with a fraudulent two lane taxpayer-funded construction conduit with multiple intersections. Before anyone gets all huffy about my remarks, I remind this board what happened when one of the DA's attorneys got a little too enthusiastic in her support of the park development and ended up losing her job. Throughout the park project's journey through the BOCC process, this board first received an advisory petition signed by between 900 and 1,000 Douglas County residents against this development. A technical error kept the official petition with just under 3,000 signatures off of the fall ballot, but a conscientious commission with these indications that there was sizable resistance to park among their constituents could have used their powers to put this through to a vote of the people. Instead, this board majority bullied park through sliding past the master plan on a technicality with self-justifying speeches. And there was the DA's office enthusiastically proclaiming that the people had no power to vote the park project agreement invalid. We have just had a reminder of another legally blessed boondoggle with the announcement of El Dorado's recent sale of Mont Blue for $17.3 billion to facilitate its mega merger with Caesars. This board's insistence that the taxpayers fund an event center to help out the wealthy parent companies of the Lake Casino properties is looking even more unethical, if not downright corrupt. It's understandable that council work closely with the Board of County Commissioners, but you owe it to the folks who pay your salary to weigh in on agenda items that are not in the taxpayer's best interest. J. 
Jim Slayton. On agenda item number four of the zoning map amendment, I believe it's not consistent with the legislative intent in requiring two readings of an ordinance to have the first reading just be perfunctory and for presentation only with no discussion and without a full packet of the agenda item under the discussion being included. The current process is not in the public interest nor in the board's interest. You should have the entire packet with maps before you at this time so that you have an entire month to consider it. Otherwise, you'll only get it with less than a week before your decision. You should change the process back to the way it used to be. For the moment, let's focus on required finding C, that the proposed amendment is compatible with the actual and master plan use of the adjacent properties. Staff and R.O. Anderson seem confused by the clear and consistent meaning of the word adjacent. It doesn't mean being somewhat nearby, as they seem to think. Douglas County Code defines it this way, two or more parcels sharing a common boundary. Three quarters of the subject property is adjacent to land zoned SFR2. The remaining one quarter is in larger developments, hence somewhat irrelevant to the subject property, which is only three acres. R.O. Anderson's claim that the adjacent property to the east has been developed with SFR1 zoning is false. The adjacent property to the east is zoned SFR2 and has one lot of over two acres, period. Likewise, staff's claim that the proposed zoning change would be compatible with the adjacent property to the north is false. That property is two lots zoned SFR2. What is the clear and compelling reason to approve this, approve this zoning map? Jim Slade, I got cut off on my last call, so I'm going to try to do the whole thing now. Chairman Penzel, do you want me to continue with that one? He had his three minutes, right? Uh, the previous one was um, less than three minutes, but I don't know exactly why the phone didn't record. Let him go. Time. Okay. For three minutes. All right. For the zoning map amendment, I believe that it's not consistent with the legislative intent in requiring two readings of an ordinance to have the first reading just be perfunctory and for presentation only with no discussion and without a full packet of the agenda item under consideration being included. The current process is not in the public interest, nor in the board's interest. You should have the entire packet with maps before you at this time, so that you have an entire month to consider it. Otherwise, you'll get to see it for less than a week before you make your decision. You should change the process back to the way it used to be. For the moment, let's focus on required finding C, that the proposed amendment is compatible with the actual and master planned use of the adjacent properties. Staff and R.O. Anderson seem confused by the clear and consistent meaning of the word adjacent. It doesn't mean being somewhat nearby, as they seem to think. Douglas County Code defines it this way. Two or more parcels sharing a common boundary. Three quarters of the subject property is adjacent to land zone SFR2. The remaining one quarter is in larger developments, and somewhat irrelevant to the subject property, which is only three acres. R.O. Anderson's claim that the adjacent property to the east has been developed with SFR1 zoning is false. The adjacent property to the east is on SFR2 and has one lot of over two acres, period. Likewise, staff claim that the proposed zoning would be compatible with the adjacent property to the north is false. That property is two lots zoned SFR2. What is the clear and compelling reason to approve the zoning map amendment? There is none, and none is offered in the packet that went to the Planning Commission. At their June meeting, however, the applicant, Mr. Prosser, explained as follows, referring to his mother, Joyce Cancia, quote, she is 92 this year, but she doesn't make enough money to be able to live where she lives. The sale of this property will provide her the money that she will be able to live 20 more years in independent senior living that she's in right now. So that is my reasoning for trying to get her the most money that she can have out of this property. So. The only reason to amend the zoning is to enable his mother to live in the style in which she's accustomed until she's 112 years old? Is that Douglas County's responsibility? Of course not. And what are the chances she'll live to an age approaching 112? Pretty close to zero. That is not an adequate reason to change the zoning. All master plan and zoning math amendments should have a high bar for approval. Just wanting to increase your profits is not sufficient. As you know, all findings must be made in the affirmative in order to approve the request. The Planning Commission voted five to one to deny this application, citing its inability to meet findings B and C. You should do the same and deny this application. 
Amy Poole, for the record, Chairman Penzel, that is the last voicemail that we have for opening public comment. Okay, thank you. Then, um, well, it's one ten, so we've been on this for five, over five minutes, and you have only received two emails or uh, voicemails. Correct. So we'll move on to uh, approval of the agenda. There are no changes to the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'd move to approve today's agenda. I'm sorry. So a motion by Commissioner Nelson, a second by Commissioner Rice. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. Motion is approved. And we'll move on to previous minutes. Do we have a motion on the previous minutes? We were at all of these meetings, so there's no exceptions. Yeah, I would uh, move to approve the minutes of May 21st, May 26th, May 27th, 2020. Second. Second. Uh, Commissioner Ingalls seconded, right? So we have a motion by Commissioner Nelson, a second by Commissioner Ingalls. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. Move on to Douglas County Award presentations. This is for presentation only, a ceremonial presentation of Proclamation 2020P-069, recognizing Trina Carter, a records clerk with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office for 30 years of dedicated service to Douglas County. Under Sheriff Engel, Ingalls, Elgis. <laughs> Did you want to make any remarks, Under Sheriff? I'm sorry, sir. Repeat that again. Did you want to make any remarks uh, on this uh, uh, presentation, Proclamation 2020P? For uh, Chairman uh, Dan Carberry, for the record, Trina's been with the Sheriff's Office for, for 30 years. Um, I grew up with Trina and known her most of my life. She does a great job. Uh, she comes from a great family and uh, mm -hmm. very proud of her. She's off today. I think they went camping, uh, but we're, we're lucky to have employees like Trina. I think she's a, a good representative of, uh, of all of uh, the people, men and women that work for the county and, and uh, just happy to have her with us. So very, very happy for her. Thank you, Sheriff. Appreciate your remarks and appreciate her service of 30 years. She should, uh, be uh, rewarded in going camping, I guess, is what she'd really like to do. So that's great. Any other comments from the board? Commissioner Ingalls? Uh, you're muted, John. Muted, John. Tina should get a special award for putting up with you guys for 30 years. That's an achievement. There you go. I and totally agree. She's a great, that's a great job. I'm sure great. Angles would want to fund that too. Any uh, other comments? Thank you, Commissioner Ingalls. All right. Um, I understand, Sheriff, that you're going to present uh, the proclamation to her when she returns. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything we can do to support it, let us know. So we will be adjourning uh, as the Douglas County Board of Commissioners and convening as the Douglas County Liquor Board. So uh, in this regard, we are now six with the sheriff being the sixth member. Douglas County Liquor Board, item one for possible action, discussion to approve the addition of a package retail liquor license to the existing, existing on-site unrestricted retail liquor license for Tahoe Beach Club represented by General Manager Robert King. Robert King signed a waiver of notice of hearing. Tahoe Beach Club is located at 1 Beach Club Drive, State Line, Nevada, 89449. Captain Mick Chaturian is going to present this, but I think it's probably going to be the undersheriff. Is that correct? Afternoon, the undersheriff, Ron Elgis, for the record. Captain Mick Chaturian is uh, not available, so I'll handle it. Uh, the application was completed and we are not contesting. Just out of curiosity, Under Sheriff, uh, 
each of these uh, four items as a different amount of money charged for the license. In this case, I think there's nothing. Um, wh what are the rules for that? Do you know offhand? Yeah, it's, sir. Sir, it's, it's based on a different type of licensing and what they're actually, this one's just adding to retail as opposed to some people are adding names or getting a new license. Yeah, and even the new licenses are different prices. Anyway. Um, I, I just saw that and I thought maybe I could ask a quick question on it. Um, are there any questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, uh, we'll be looking for a motion. Um, Mr. Chair, are you ready for a motion? Yes, sir. Okay, I move approval, move to approve the addition of a packaged retail liquor license to the existing on-site and unrestricted retail liquor license for Tahoe Beach Club as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner uh, Walsh, a second by uh, Commissioner Nelson. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. The motion carries. So we'll be moving on to item Number two on uh, the liquor licenses, and I got to bring it back up. So take a minute. I got to find it again. Okay, for possible action. Uh, discussion to approve the on-site beer and wine only retail liquor license for the Kokomo's LLC DBA Kokomo's Quinique Eats uh, represented by owners Maurice and Amber La Lamir Larimar. Maurice and Amber Larimar have both signed a waiver of notice of hearing. Kokomo's Quinique Eats is located at 795 Tillman Lane, Gardnerville, Nevada, 89460. Under Sheriff Elgis. Under Sheriff Ron Elgis for the record again. Uh, yeah, all the application information was completed and looked into, and we're not contesting this one either. All right. Any questions, comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, that's pronounced unique eats, even though it starts with a Q. That is unique. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Rice. Okay. Do we have a motion then? Mr. Chair, I moved uh, to approve the on site retail liquor license for beer and wine for Kokomo's LLC. DBA Kokomo's Unique Eats as presented. Second. So I, we had a tie. It goes to Mr. Rice. <laughs> we have a motion by Commissioner Walsh, a second by Commissioner Rice. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays? And I think I'm hearing the sheriff say uh, aye. 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 So <laughs> item number three, uh, for possible action discussion to approve applicant Raghan <clears throat> Meta to the existing package retail liquor license for Genu Enterprises. Raghan Meta has signed a waiver of notice of hearing. Genu Enterprises DBA Lucky Market is located at 1384 Highway, U.S. Highway 395, Gardnerville. Gardnerville, Nevada, 89410. Under Sheriff Felches. Under Sheriff Ryan Elvis, for the record, uh, this is an addition, uh, subject turn 21, and is added. Background's completed, and we're not contesting. All right. Any uh, questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, we'll be looking for a motion from the board. I'd move to approve the addition of Reagan Meta to the existing packaged retail liquor license held by Janu Enterprises as presented. Second. 
So a motion by Commissioner Nelson, second by Commissioner Walsh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. The motion carries 6 0. Last four possible action discussion to approve the on site unrestricted retail license and restricted gaming pending Nevada State Gaming Approval and addition, additional application, Jersey Fenton for applicant, Jersey Fen, Jesse Fenton for Tahoe Tavern and Grill LLC. Tahoe Tavern and Grill LLC is represented by owners Wendy and David Thoreau and co-applicant Jesse Fenton and all three have signed a waiver of notice of hearing. Tahoe Tavern and Grill LLC is located at 219 Kingsbury grade, state line, Nevada, 89449. Under Sheriff? Under Sheriff, Ron August for the record. Um, the applic applic application has been completed and we're not contesting. Questions from the board? Uh, uh, Under Sheriff, uh, just for my own information, is this the former goalpost? Under Sheriff August for the record. Yeah, the Sheriff and I are discussing. I think I believe that's where it's at. Thank you. All right, so we have a location. Uh, any questions, other questions from the board? Seeing none, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I think that we approve the on-site unrestricted retail liquor license and restricted gaming pending uh, Nevada State Gaming approval. In uh, additional applicant, Jesse Fenton for Tahoe Tech, Tavern and Grill LLC. Second. So I have a motion by Commissioner Rice, a second by Commissioner Nelson. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. The motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Sheriff, for your participation. And uh, under Sheriff L, just uh, thank you for your explanations. Well, we'll move on. We'll adjourn as the Douglas County Liquor Board and reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners. We'll move to the consent calendar. Any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, and I, I haven't been told of any, then we'll look for a motion for approval of the consent calendar. Yeah, I'd move to approve the consent calendar A through H. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Nelson and a second by Commissioner Walsh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. All right, we'll move on to the administrative agenda. Item one is appointment of a private sector representative to WNND. I'll read the title for possible action to discuss the discussion to approve the appointment of Douglas County's private sector representative to the Western Nevada Development District, WNDD, for the term expiring December 31st, 2021, due to the resignation of Mr. Bill Chernock. Mr. Cates, your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, earlier this year, Bill Chernock stepped down from his appointment with the Western Nevada Development District. Um, as part of his retirement from the um, Carson Valley Chamber of Commerce. Commerce. Um, he was Douglas County's private sector representative. Uh, this left his position uh, vacant um, and that term would expire December 31st of 2021. So we need somebody for about 18 months to fill out his term. Uh, Douglas County has three seats on the WNDD board. Uh, Vice Chair Larry Walsh and Economic Vitality Manager Lisa Granahan currently serve as the board and staff representative. Uh, the WNDD bylaws allow for the third seat, which can be a private sector representative, representative from the business, industrial, professional, and educational mm -hmm. segment of our jurisdictions. Of our jurisdiction, excuse me. Uh, we uh, solicited um, applicants. According to Douglas County policy, we received two applications, one from Alicia Main with the Carson Valley Chamber of Commerce and another from Kitty McKay, Carson Tahoe Health. And their applications are included in your packet and they are both on the Zoom call for you to ask questions. And with that, concludes my presentation. All right. 
any questions from board members before we hear from the ladies? Um, Ms. Granahan, do you have anything that you want to say about um, the appointment or the requirements for the job? Uh, thank, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Lisa Granahan, Economic Vitality Manager. <laughs> I just really want to thank the applicants um, for applying. There is quite a bit of travel um, involved in this appointment. Um, meetings are held every other month at um, 930 um, on the fourth Monday. And they're at Story, the Story County facility in the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center. And then two times a year, we make field trips to one of the jurisdictions for an afternoon meeting um, to take to see one of the economic um, happening in those counties. So there's, during the COVID uh, emergency meetings have been virtual, but we have our fingers crossed we'll be going back to in-person meetings. So I just wanted to share with the board, there's quite a bit of travel um, connected to this appointment. And the fact that we have applications, I think is terrific. Um, and that's a sign of the commitment of many of folks in our community. And I'm here if you have any other questions. All right, well, thank you. I guess uh, we'll hear from the applicants and we'll go with uh, Ms. McKay first. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Well, I'm very grateful to have you consider my application. I've lived in Douglas County for 15 years and up until just a few weeks ago, I wouldn't have been in a position to do this, but our youngest just graduated Douglas High School. So there's a little more opening, thank you. And I have to say, yes. And I was just blown away by our community and the high school and just an extraordinary experience. We'll keep forever. Um, so I've been in Douglas for 15 years. I've been at Carson Tahoe Health for 11 and I'm the director of mission integration. And what that means is I'm over the experience of our patients and our staff, as well as our community outreach. And our mission is to enhance the health and well being of the community we serve. And healthcare, access to healthcare, um, really enhancing health in our region and our community is pivotal when it comes to economic resilience and vitality as we've seen, especially during this pandemic. So I think probably um, one of the things I bring is a healthcare perspective. And for many, many years prior, I, what my husband, my late husband and I owned uh, restaurants. So I also have a really keen understanding of what it is to be a mom and pop. <laughs> nice. All right, thank you. Uh, questions for Ms. McKay? Uh, Commissioner Ingalls, go ahead. Um, Ms. K, your experience in healthcare is invaluable. And what what do you think if uh, it was possible to establish a health research center in our valley here? Um, what are you thinking it would do? I don't know. Um, it's a uh, something that has crossed my mind. We have uh, continuous growth in the area and our current um, availability of beds seems to be uh, pretty much uh, well utilized. Um, we have a lot of clinical experienced individuals um, and research is a very important uh, academic part of healthcare. And it could be a nonprofit organization of some sort and headquartered here in our valley. Uh, it would bring jobs and things of that nature. It's, it's just kind of an idea that uh, we could all think about. And you, of course, being in the healthcare industry, uh, have direct experience with something like that. <clears throat> Yes. Well, so we uh, we aren't a research entity and typically research um, hospitals are in larger metropolitan areas. But that being said, one of the things we uh, in order to maintain our 501c3 status 
every three years we do a community health needs assessment. And in fact, we just completed one. So it really gives us an idea of what our community needs the most in terms of health. And though the top three are mental health, not surprisingly, access to health care, and then also diabetes and working with all the associated complications of it. And so, um, you know, perhaps rather than medical research, there's a way that we could come together and collaborate to look at how we can meet those immediate needs for the community. Well, thank you very much. And I think with your experience, you'd be a very valuable asset to the organization. And I'm just throwing that out as some ideas that uh, we could work towards. And, and uh, this, is, this is some of the things that we should do is use our imagination about what are the possibilities. And so uh, this is just something to put on the back burner and think about. So thank you very much for your time and your uh, enthusiasm and your interest. Well, thank, thank you. you. Don't worry, Arigato. Ah, Nyongo Shaviran desuka? Yes, so desne. Ah, so desne. Suwarashi desu yo. That's it. <laughs> what I what I didn't mention, but you may have read, I lived for years in Japan and uh, worked for a Japanese company as an American woman in an international manufacturing environment. So that's. Uh, Believe it or not, even though this melon is getting older, I still remember my Japanese. And it sounds like you do as well, though. Yeah, but I only lived there three years. It's, it's an amazing language. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, I just Mimi. bowed, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> you got me back in there. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Alicia? Miss Bain, are you there? I am. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the commission today. I wanted to communicate my desire to serve on the Western Nevada Development District Board as a private sector rep representative. I grew up here in the Carson Valley and had the privilege of working for the last 10 years at the Carson Valley Chamber of Commerce, first as your chamber manager and now as your executive director. My career has provided the unique opportunity to interact with many of our businesses listening to their concerns and finding solutions to our challenges. We have a diverse group of businesses who greatly benefit from WNDD projects and services, from the economic planning to infrastructure development. And with the changes of the economic landscape due to COVID-19, crisis has dramatically affected our businesses and will continue to do so. While supporting our local is key, collaborating with regional level with our neighbors will help us maintain a robust, robust and sustainable economy the WNDD Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy is an important tool in developing this resilience. I feel that I have the experience and knowledge to advocate for our local businesses and work hard with our regional partners on implementing the WNDD projects and services. So I wanna thank you guys for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Main, appreciate you uh, making uh, the comments. Um, any questions for Ms. Main? All right, if we have no questions for Ms. Main, I, I have one and that is, uh, are you familiar uh, with uh, any of the uh, grants that uh, WNDD gets from the Department of Agriculture? You know, I'm working closely with Lisa and um, Cheryl Gonzalez and getting up to speed on a lot of those. And, you know, we were talking about the one and possibly with uh, Main Street Gardnerville. So I'm listening to a lot of the things with them right now. All right. Um, Ms. Granahan, do you have any comments? Lisa Granahan for the record. Uh, no, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Again, just my real appreciation um, for these ladies for submitting applications. Um, mm -hmm. really is, there's a lot of travel involved with this. Night. All right, then. Um, since uh, we didn't really address that. Um, sure. um, yes, sure. Commissioner Ingalls. We have to select one of the two. <laughs> one. Ms. Granahan, can't you uh, 
expand the board by one. These are two top-notch candidates. I, I don't see it in the bylaws, but I, I suppose you could choose an, um, an alternate if uh, necessary. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Cates, is that within our, our policy manual? Gonna, yeah, there you go. Um, I'm not familiar with the bylaws of WNDD. I would refer to Lisa on that. Uh, Lisa Granham, for the record, there there is we we get three appointments from um, Douglas County, um, and the third can be a private sector representative, as these uh, applicants are. There there is no provision uh, for a, an alternative. All right, so we have to make the tough decision, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I, I guess I would like to ask both of the ladies um, about the travel issue. If they have the, uh, uh, I guess, I would guess they're reimbursed for travel, but do they have the time to do this travel that may be necessary? I'll start with Ms. McKay. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, and that's kind of how I led. Is that I have a real desire to give back to this community that's given so much to me. And prior to my daughter graduating, there was just way too much on my plate. But I can certainly work it out with my work schedule, and it really also encompasses part of the role I do. So I I looked at that very seriously, and I feel comfortable with it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It's me. Yeah, I spoke to Lisa about the travel prior to, and you know, as you know, I, I took over the chamber in March as the executive director. But I think it's all about priorities, and when you're working with the business community, and these are their priorities, it has to be, come first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Thank you for your question, Mr. Nelson. Further questions from the board? Commissioner Walsh, then Commissioner Rice. Thank you. I, someone made a comment about um, travel reimbursement. I'm on the board. I don't think we get reimbursed for anything. Is that right, Lisa? Um, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Lisa Granahan. Uh, generally, I take a county car uh, to these meetings, and any of the other representatives are welcome to travel with me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> It, I've been on the board for a couple of years, and, and it's, uh, or at least one year. Uh, it's a great organization that they, they do pivotal work for, um, uh, for Northern Nevada counties. Um, all I can say is I really appreciate both candidates uh, uh, submitting their, um, uh, their applications. I think they're both very well qualified. Um, the only thing I can mention is I've, I've known Alicia Main for quite a while and I'm on the chamber board as well. So I know that uh, she's a, um, a go-getter uh, for sure. And, and uh, uh, whenever a new issue comes up um, uh, that needs the chamber input, uh, she's Johnny on the spot and, and I appreciate her help. Uh, Ms. McKay, I don't, don't know, haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, but I'm sure you're the same way. So thank you. Mr. Rice. I've known uh, Alicia for as long as I've been on this board. Uh, she's uh, always helpful, friendly, uh, go through the Boy Scout thing, and then uh, she qualifies on all counts, and delight, delightful to work with. Uh, however, uh, I, uh, I looked at the uh, resume for uh, uh, Ms. McKay, and I was totally blown away by it. Um, I'm afraid that uh, at, at this moment, and I'm not afraid, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm really uh, tending towards uh, Miss McKay because of her experience and background, um, and that's not to take anything away from um, Alicia. But uh, I really think that uh, uh, qualification-wise, uh, um, um, Ms. McKay is uh, 
the rising star on this one. Uh, Commissioner Nelson. I, I'm going to ditto what uh, Commissioner Rice just said, and I was very, very impressed with uh, Ms. McKay's resume. Uh, I like Alicia a lot. I've known her for a long time, but I think uh, Ms. McKay would make an excellent appointment to this board. All right, and if there are no further comments, then we would be looking for a motion. Yeah, I'll move to appoint uh, Kitty McKay to the Western Nevada Development District as Douglas County's private sector representative to replace Bill Turnock for the term expiring December 31st, 2021. I'll second that. So we have a motion from Commissioner Nelson, a second by Commissioner Walsh. Uh, any comments, further discussion? No, I'd just like to, again, reiterate, uh, I thank uh, both candidates for their uh, applications. Um, uh, I was leaning towards uh, 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 Ms. Main, but uh, I want to make it unanimous, uh, so I'm voting yes. Uh, I, too, was uh, leaning towards uh, Ms. Main, but uh, I also would like to make it uh, unanimous. Uh, I think um, Ms. Main would do a bang-up job. Uh, but I think Ms. McKay will do a great job also. Uh, and if we can make it unanimous, I think it's important. Uh, so without any further comments, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Mm -hmm. No nays. Oh, well, congratulations, Ms. McKay. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to give it my all. Appreciate Ms. all Main. that you do. Thank you. Miss Main, don't go away discouraged. Not at all, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll be moving on to our next item, number two, which is uh, janitorial services. And uh, I'll, I'll read this into the record. For possible action, discussion to approve janitorial services contract in the amount of $232,680 with Qual Econ USA Incorporated and authorize the public works director or county manager to execute the contract and approve contract amendments up to 10% of the contract amount. Ms. Ritger, <laughs> Mr. Ritger, excuse me. Uh, commissioners and board, um, Bill Richard, Director of Public Works for the record. Um, this item, um, the uh, the current current janitorial contract or the uh, contractor for the current, currently on the contract is uh, Rosie's Emerald Services. They were awarded this contract about a year, uh, well, November of 2018. Um, and with the COVID pandemic and the uh, increased uh, um, or hyphen disinfection procedures and stuff to, to maintain our our facilities. They have asked to be relieved from the contract, um, and we uh, are, we went out to bid for a new contract uh, with uh, with the uh, hyphen awareness of, uh, of cleaning protocols in, in place uh, as we move forward here. So um, this is um, we uh, solicited bids. Um, and received two qualified bids, one from Lawyers Enterprises and one from Qual Econ USA. Um, uh, the, the, that information is in your board packet. Um, what we are asking today, uh, or what, what we're coming to the board today with is um, the request to, to uh, award the contract to Qual Econ USA. Um, the board should be aware that this they were not the, um, or, or per the NRS, I should say, the requirements uh, is that the award uh, needs to be awarded, or the, the contract needs to be awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Um, but in the NRS, that's judged based on a, a various factors, um, which are namely price, also conformance to the specifications, qualifications of the bidder. Um, and experience as well as past performance and then the, what's in the best interest of the public. So what you'll read in the packet and what I want to just highlight here is that Myers Enterprises 
we are not recommending to be awarded the contract. We did submit the lowest price bid. Um, however, um, they were uh, they were our contractor uh, two contractor tra- contracts ago. Um, uh, that contract expired in 2018, um, and, and and the county at that time opted not to extend or or extend the con- uh, just renew a contract with them, but went out to bid at, at that time, which is when Rosie's Emerald Services was was uh, awarded the contract. Um, so based on uh, our past experience, which we would rate as sort of as neutral on Myers, uh, but also in terms of their uh, other references, uh, we are not recommending them as a as a qualified bidder and and are moving forward. We're here to request that we go with Paul Econ as the uh, lowest responsible bidder. Um, I'm sure there's anything else I need to address at this time, but um, I'm more than willing to take questions from the board. I think the first one would be, this is an increase of $91,000 in the contract. What's the advantage there? It, um, so, it, so it is a, um, there's, there's some uh, oddities here in the financials. Um, the, the award, the, the award, con- the award or the current contract with uh, Rosie's Emo Cleaning Services is for 168,000. Uh, so this is a, an increase um, in the budgeting process this year. Within with COVID, the um, the budget for for the janitorial services was was brought forward with um, a 2018 actual, which at the time was 141,000. So it's not reflective of our current contract pricing. Um, but you're right; it does in, it does represent an increase over what we uh, are are currently paying. It also it, it would increase it's it would represent an increase in contract price for either of these vendors, either Myers or or Wall uh, Econ. Um, uh, Commissioner Benzel, to answer that question, um, it I think it's reflective of the um, the past tendency. Uh, and I can, and I think Rosie's would would be a, a, a our current contract would be a, a good example of that. I think it is a, a, a representative of the past um, um, underestimation of the actual manpower and labor involved in doing a contract of this size. Um, uh, I can tell you that Myers and Rosie's Edmo Cleaning for for either of those companies, we as Douglas County would represent their largest client. And I think they were foraying into an area that um, that they were not prepared for in terms of the complexity and the, and the number of man hours and, and, and labor uh, requirements to provide service effectively to the county. Uh, Qual Econ, by the um, on the other side of that spectrum, has multiple large contracts in uh, the Reno Sparks area with government facilities as well as Carson City. So they're very accustomed to the needs of a government agency, and to uh, to the complexity. I, I'll be quite you know one of the complexities in our organization is the jay like building uh, when you're dealing with the uh, judicial law enforcement areas and things like that. So so it's a it's a different it's, it's different than just jet standard janitorial services for offices and and and, um, and light industrial areas. Oh, that's, I uh, should have played music for that one. Um, it, it seems to me um, that it, if it's increase and it's uh, COVID-19 related, um, then, then we should expect to see people walking around with uh, disinfectant and, and gloves and masks and, and doing more disinfecting. Is that what we can expect to see? I think the level, yes, I believe the level of cleaning, uh, I mean, it's not going to be during the day, but yes, the evening cleaning crew, when they come in after hours to do it, will, um, they will have protocols in place to maintain uh, a higher level of disinfection as opposed to just uh, a simple wipe down of surfaces and dusting. We won't see that during the day when people are there? Which is uh, the- we do not have <laughs> Janitorial services are, are are essentially after hours. They come in after hours for cleanup. They're not there. It during used to the, be the case. 
That's not the new normal. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, if I can just add, we have protocols with our staff during the day to clean high touch areas and keep things sanitized throughout the day in relation to COVID-19. You do? Hmm. Yes. Chair, Mr. Angles, go ahead. Mr. Ritter, I don't think anybody is disputing the qualifications of the organization that you're recommending. Uh, I think the question here is, we we set a budget and now we're at 90K over that budget item. Is that my understanding? Um, yeah. Yes, um, I, I guess the simple simple answer is yes. Uh, but we've worked this with finance and and have the funding Mike in in place to be able to, to award this contract. If Mr. Chairman, if I could just add a comment, um, the budget of one hundred and forty one thousand for next fiscal year um, appears to have been entered in error. Um, it should have at least been as much as the current content. And I think it's my understanding and talking with Bill that the in intent was to budget at about 180. Um, of course, this is over that amount. Um, we have worked with finance. There are a couple of things uh, we can do to cover the, the difference. Um, one of them is the cost allocations to adjust to non-general fund agencies for some of the cleaning that's done for them, um, as well as uh, we do expect um, Ending fund balance from the current year that should be more than adequate to, to cover this. And I would also just add, I, I know it, I know it's a cost increase, but they're putting a lot more resources towards it. And I do think in this age of COVID-19, we want to get the best quality cleaning service that we can. Thank you. Commissioner Walsh. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cates, would any of this uh, uh, increase in cost be covered under the CARES? Act reimbursement. Can we apply that any of that to this to this contract? Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, um, I'm not sure. Um, we've added it to the list of things to consider. Um, they are doing more cleaning. Um, I, I'm not sure if we could cover the increase with COVID-19 funds themselves. Uh, we certainly, they have um, uh, a list of services that are optional, like additional cleaning, that sort of thing. I think to the extent that we ask them to clean offices uh, due to COVID-19, it certainly could be reimbursable. So uh, it's not a very clear answer, but uh, we're looking into it. It's, it's on the list, but I'm not certain if the increase in cost for uh, the, the base cleaning services would necessarily be covered by the COVID-19 fund. Thank you. I, I would, uh, as Bill Richter for the record, Director of Public Works, um, I'd add to that, uh, to what Patrick, uh, Patrick has said, is that um, it is possible, and we'll look into it, that the chemical supplies and the disinfectants that are used, if, if we do uh, hyphen that in terms of rotation and types of chemicals, that there may be some offsetting costs there that we'd be able to capture. Um, and as Patrick said, I think if we have an infection or if we had a, um, an infection in the county facilities or with the, with the staff and that required a special cleaning, that would, uh, uh, presumably be covered under the COVID um, CARES Act. Yes, definitely. Well, it, the NACO guidance is that it would be covered if it is directly related to COVID-19, especially for enhanced cleaning. That's why I was asking if they're doing additional cleaning uh, during the day to keep the offices sanitized. Um, because that clearly is uh, COVID-19 related. And you don't have to justify it any further, according to NACO. So I don't know if you assume that they're a, uh, an authority on this, but they, they were the ones that obtained the money for us. So I, I would go with some of what they're saying. And, and we, what we don't want is to be listed as one of the communicators of the disease. And so I, I think the error on the side of safety in this case, with more cleaning rather than less cleaning and done by the professionals you hired to do it. I also can't 
um, let this go without saying, this is an indicator of some of the things that we were not made aware of when we approved the budget. And I think it would behoove us to have somebody go back through the budget completely and review all the contracts and review where we stand on them. So we'll know if there are any other issues like this. A $91,000 oversight, I'll just call it that, and is possible to make it up. What you see in the financial impact is that you're hoping that the greater antis than anticipated will make up the difference. How many other organizations within the county budget requirements are thinking the same thing? And therefore, when you get to the July of next year, are you gonna be everybody's bidding on the same amount of money? And you should know that before you get that far. That's why we were looking for quarterly statistics as to where we are, which we haven't seen in the whole time, been promised, but haven't seen. So I, I just mentioned that because it's a particular issue. <clears throat> in my view, it's a big issue. So, so Mr. Chairman, if I could, um, we're, we're going to, we're preparing to start uh, presenting revenue projections for you on a monthly basis, starting with the, the, the second meeting in July. Uh, we've got a format worked out for that. It gives us enough time to put the reports together after the, the first of the month. Uh, so we'll be sharing that with you. Um, the only thing I would say about this contract is it went out for bid. And at the time the budgets were put together, there was no way of knowing what the bids were going to come back. And uh, we had two bids and both of them exceeded the budget. So we're going to have to come back and find a way to do a bit now. Yeah, well, they would have exceeded the budget if they just if you just kept the same person in in the position, if you kept the same company. I mean, you, you had what, 165 or 185 for the current company or the, the past company, and you only had $141,000 in the budget. Somebody somewhere should have been reviewing that prior to it ever getting that far. My point, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I think it was explained a little bit that um, they missed this number. They were looking at the, I guess they missed the actuals was actually higher than this for last year or coming in higher. So I think they're, they're, this is probably 50,000 over, which is still a huge amount. And I think that we really need to tighten this up uh, on the budgeting process, but um, I don't sure we can hang it all on this one issue. All right. Good, good of you to be a defender, um, or is it unusual? But I don't know. Unusual. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, so we've got this pretty much discussed. Any other questions or comments from the board? Then we'd be looking for a motion. No motion. I'll, I'll move to approve a janitorial services contract with Equal Econ USA Incorporated for Douglas County facilities for $232,680 annually and authorize the public works director or county manager to execute the contract and approve contract amendments up to 10% of the contract amount. Okay. So we have a motion by Commissioner Nelson and a Second by Commissioner Walsh. Um, and uh, so we'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays, then the motion carries. I would just add one caveat. And that is the enterprise funds shouldn't take an inordinate amount of cost allocation since the people are one and the same. End of that story. Moving on. We we'll go to item three. Read it into the record. Macro. for possible action. 
discussion to submit a recommendation to the state engineer regarding an application for a proposed change in water use application 89732. The application was made by the state of Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Division of State Parks and proposes to change the point of diversion in place of use of a portion of existing permit 24699 certificate 7340. The proposed change in place of use is from recreation use in Washoe County to recreation use in Douglas County, Nevada. Mr. Ricker. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Ricker, uh, Director of Public Works for the record. Um, uh, I feel a little silly here because of last, at the last commission meeting, um, we had a, a, an agenda item very similar to this with, with regards to a, a petition to the state engineer by an agency for a, a, a water rights uh, diversion and change. And, um, and you had asked me if this was a common, if this occurs commonly, and I said no, because it's, it's, uh, it's odd that we're here on back-to-back -back meetings with this, because I don't think this has happened in at least 10 or 15 years prior to this. So. So this is not a common occurrence. It is, uh, but it is unique that it's happening twice in in uh, in, in in the span of two meetings. Um, in this case, this application um, that was submitted to the uh, state engineer uh, was from the uh, state of Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, their division of state parks, and they are proposing to change the point of diversion and place of use for a small portion of their existing permit. 24699 uh, certificate 7340, which is an underground well located at the uh, Sand Harbor State Park. Um, uh, that that well has appropriated to it 48.5 acre feet annually of water rights. Um, they are, this application is to change uh, or to move 3.0 acre feet annually of those water rights. Um, to an existing underground well located in the Spooner Lake State Park. Um, this, um, this diversion or change uh, is intended to support um, the Spooner Front County Country Improvement Project, which will consist of a new visitors and interpretive center and amphitheater at the Spooner Lake State Park. Uh, that project was approved, um, I think late, uh, mid last year, actually, and they are in the process of going out to bid for construction on that at this point. Uh, there is a there is a write up from the uh, I think it's Tahoe Tribune in your um, board packet about the improvements to the um, to the Spooner Lake State Park and what's going to be happening uh, starting this uh, construction season. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Commissioner Ingalls. Ricker, um, which basin is this in? The water rights are in which basin? Are they in basin 105? Tahoe Basin. It's, it's Tahoe Basin, and I will be quite honest, Commissioner um, Ingalls, I do not know specifically which, bas which basin it would be. All right, um, so, well, okay, let me back up here. So we would be giving up water rights <clears throat> so they could use the mountain spooner? No, we, they would be uh, there. The state park is, is um, taking three acre feet of water rights from their sand harbor um, um, well or their, that, that point of diversion, uh, a groundwater well, and moving those three acre feet of water rights into uh, the sand uh, the Spooner Lake uh, State Park well, which is in Douglas County. So it's, they're moving moving the water rights from one county to the other within that same hydraulic basin, I believe. Thank you. Further questions? Any comments? Commissioner Nelson. Well, just, that, uh, just reiterating what Mr. Richard said, um, I've been watching the board for like 15 years and I don't think I've ever seen any of these and all of a sudden we have two at once. So it is kind of interesting. Apparently the Park and Recreation's uh, State Department is doing some readjustment at this point in time. 
I think more importantly, the state engineer is getting involved in more of the movement of the um, water rights and yeah. making sure that they're all accounted for, which is going to put some pressure on us uh, to make sure we uh, have all of our water rights accounted for. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions, um, we'd be looking for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move we submit a recommendation to the state engineer in support of the state of the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Division of State Parks application 89732 to change the point of diversion and place of use of a portion of existing permit 24699 certificate 7340 as presented. I'll second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Walsh, second by Commissioner Rice. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays, the motion carries. So um, it carries 5-0, so we'll be moving on. Item four. is for presentation only. For presentation only, introduce ordinance 2020-1572, a request for a zoning map amendment from SFR2, single family residential two acre minimum lot size to SFR1, single family residential one acre minimum lot size for approximately 3.1 acres. The subject property is located at 1135 Centerville Lane at the northeast corner of Centerville Lane and Pleasant View Drive in the Gardnerville Ranchos Community Plan. The applicant is Jim Prosser, trustee of Joyce A. Cancelay, Cancelier, I guess, uh, Trust APN 1220-08-802-015. Mr. Booth. Good afternoon, Chairman Penzel, members of the board, thank you. Sam Booth, uh, planning manager for the record. Chairman, as you just read, uh, this is an introduction of this ordinance only. Uh, per NRS, no board action is required this afternoon. Uh, just the ordinance is required to be read by title, as you just did. Uh, this item was heard at the June 9th, uh, 2020 planning commission meeting. The application was denied five to one by the planning commission. Um, after introduction today, this item would be presented for action at the August 6th uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. Okay. And any questions from the board? Commissioner Nelson. Yeah, um, in my nearly 50 years in real estate, I've always considered adjacent, meaning having a common uh, border with another property. Am I wrong in assuming that? Uh, there was much discussion, uh, Commissioner, at the Planning Commission um, on that topic. Um, I think, yes, very literal uh, definition of, of adjacent is you know, obviously sharing the border there. What much of the discussion was is, does that also include properties that are across the road? If there's a right of way um, or an easement or something else like that um, adjacent to the property. Um, so there was some discussion of, of properties that were across uh, across the road from this this property, but yeah, the, the truest sense of, of the term adjacent, sure, uh, sharing sharing the property line. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, you were involved quite a bit in that discussion. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, Sam Taylor, on behalf of Douglas County DA's office, uh, there is a definition of uh, adjacent. Uh, and abutting in Appendix A of Title 20. And I read that to the Planning Commission when they made their determination. And I did note for the purposes of the discussion from my perspective that um, adjacent to does not necessarily include a road for the purposes of zoning. In other words, if you're examining zoning, um, you know, that's, that's something different. So you would look across the road. Otherwise you would be stuck say for example, have a road on three sides, then you would not be able to actually have anything be adjacent to it for the purposes of determining what's next to it. So it's 
that was my opinion, of course, and the PC did not necessarily take my advice on this subject. So, <laughs> um, and they're free to do so. Okay. Commissioner Ingalls, you were going to say something? Uh, Mr. Booth, would uh, these properties now be on the grid system for water and sewage or separate? Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner Ingalls. Sam Booth, for the record, uh, again. Uh, as I understand it, they're in the service area for the Gardnerville Ranchos. Um, uh, the uh, general manager, uh, Greg Reed, had reached out and said that they would need to annex with, into the service. Well, excuse me, they're in the service area, but they would need a formal annexation agreement with Gardnerville Ranchos. Um, and so they would need to go to the Ranchos board for that. Thank you. That, that process would typically take place uh, if a zoning amendment was approved but before a subdivision application was, was approved. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Nelson. Yeah, getting back to this adjacent, I suppose if I was an appraiser describing a property, I would say the property was adjacent to the road and adjacent to another property to the west, et cetera. In other words, it would have to be actually on that property line to be adjacent. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, I have one question and that is, uh, has the grid evaluated this and the grid board of directors made any recommendations on it? Uh, Chairman Penzel, Sam Booth, once again, um, the uh, board of directors has not evaluated this uh, as of yet. Um, again, we, we have a will serve letter from Gardnerville Ranchos, uh, and, and they indicated that they would uh, need to take action on the annexation prior to serving, but they, they have a will serve from the Ranchos board. Okay. I didn't see that in the, in the background. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments? Okay, so it's been re uh, read into the record. Uh, there was a comment about uh, reading things into the record. And uh, Mr. Taylor, can you make a comment on what the legislative intent was? Uh, I guess Mr. Ritchie's here. He, he has experience with this question. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. The intent of the introduction is to then publish it in the newspaper and to allow everyone to know about it. Um, that is why there isn't, when the initial reading introduction is made, there isn't a debate or discussion on it because the whole purpose of the statutory scheme is to introduce it and then everybody has an opportunity to know that the board is considering taking some action. Um, that is why, um, primarily why uh, the the agenda item isn't for possible action until it's actually the, the second reading after everybody has been notified that the board might be considering taking some action. Okay. Any questions of Mr. Ritchie? All right. Ms. Uh, Kixmore, uh, you will have an opportunity to speak up when we hear this for action. Um, any other questions or comments? So we have read it into the record and it can now be published. We'll move on to item five. For possible action. Discussion on ordinance 2020-1571 to amend section 20.660.020 of the Douglas County Code relative to commercial and business services uses in order to revise standards for pet services within the commercial and industrial zoning districts and provide uniformity for certain aspects of pet kennel facilities within Douglas County. Second reading, Mr. Booth and Ms. Kixmiller. Now's the time. Mr. Booth, are you gonna have Ms. Kixmiller speak or are you gonna do it? Uh, Chairman Penzel, I'd leave that to you. I've got a few slides that I can show, and I know Mrs. Uh, Ms. Kixmiller has uh, some comments prepared as well. Okay. 
Go ahead then, Mr. Booth, present your slides. Okay. Okay, attempting to uh, share a screen with the board today. Uh, let me know if you can't see that, uh, but this is item number five, as you just read, Chairman, uh, and I'm Sam Booth, Planning Manager for the record. So a little background on this item here. Uh, last year in 2019, the applicant uh, inquired about locating a dog daycare facility uh, within the town of Gardnerville in a GC General Commercial Zoning District. Um, and at that time, staff and the applicant uh, had decided that the uh, proposed business use best fit within the allowed description of a pet service. Um, and then uh, closely following that, the applicant applied for and received approval of the design review uh, in a minor variance uh, for the business at 1267 Highway 395 in Gardnerville. Um, and the approval included the condition that the business could not include any overnight boarding of animals. Uh, and this was uh, primarily due to um, a, the definition of a pet service in, in Douglas County Code, uh, Title 20.660.020, which defines a pet service as any single person, entity, or group engaged in grooming, training, uh, pets, primarily dogs and cats for commercial purposes at any residence or other location in Douglas County, a veterinary clinic or hospital is excluded from this provision. And then there are two conditions that, that go on with this definition. Uh, the first one speaking about setbacks uh, and the second one speaking uh, that it must, the pet service must also be in compliance with the provisions of uh, Title VI of Douglas County Code, uh, which relates to the Animal Services Department uh, and their permitting. So there, there's no discussion in this definition about overnight boarding, and we do specifically call out overnight boarding of animals being allowed uh, within our definition of a kennel. Um, and we have uh, several other sections of code that speak to that. Um, let's see here. Uh, Douglas County Code, yes, uh, Title 20 outside of the Tahoe Basin regulations, uh, as I was saying, only uh, permit overnight boarding or, or kenneling of dogs within that definition of a kennel. Uh, and that is limited to zoning designations of RA5, Rural Agriculture 5 acres, or Rural Agriculture 10 acres, or A19 and FR19 zoning districts. So essentially you have to have five acres or more to be able to board uh, uh, animals overnight. However, uh, in Douglas County Code, we have a separate section of code for uh, Tahoe Basin regulations. Um, uh, obviously, that's because within the Tahoe Basin, TRPA uh, has also reviewed our code uh, and has input on our code. And that section of code was developed at a later date uh, than, than the rest of the uh, code uh, pertaining to the entire county. Um, within this section of code, uh, we have a definition for animal services, uh, which says that uh, these are establishments primarily engaged in performing services for animals, such as veterinary services, animal hospitals, animal grooming, pet sitting, and overnight boarding services. And so you can see the, the last one there, it does specifically call out overnight boarding services in that definition. Um, additionally, in Carson City, their zoning code and the definition for a kennel uh, a play, includes a place of where 10 dogs or more, not less than six months of age are kept, harbored, boarded, or maintained at any time. Um, and that use of a kennel is allowed in general industrial, general commercial, limited industrial districts, and requires a, a conditional use permit within a single family five acre or retail commercial districts. Um, so uh, the applicant with, with this application for a zoning text amendment has requested a change to the code uh, to that definition of a pet service to uh, add a second condition or really a third condition. Um, we're adding this in as item number two, as you see here that's underlined to say that a pet service in commercial and industrial zoning districts may include overnight boarding. Um, so specifically calling it out in this definition as we do in other areas of the code. Um, you can see in the table here, uh, I have highlighted a pet service. This is our use table. It says where this is allowed and where this isn't allowed. Uh, the X means it is not allowed in that zoning district. The D means design review is required, uh, which is a staff level review. And that's uh, the process the applicant went through with this, uh, with this item here. 
So uh, just in summary, uh, staff believes that the findings A through D required for a zoning text amendment uh, can all be made. Those uh, findings in a response to each of the findings are included on packet pages 367 and 368. Um, this change would be consistent once again with allowances that we uh, already have in our code in the Tahoe Basin uh, and also for uh, the definition of a kennel as well as within Carson City. Um, and uh, our requirements here um, would still require a review and service uh, or review and permit from community development for the design review and from Douglas County Animal Services uh, for their permit uh, as already it, it states in code. Uh, additionally, we did run uh, the proposed changes by the Animal Services Department and their uh, supervisor, and um, they have approved, approved the changes and didn't, didn't take issue with anything proposed. That's all I've got, um, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, Stacy Kicksmiller, the applicant, is on the line uh, to speak. Ms. Kicksmiller, do you want to add to or subtract from what uh, he has said? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to the commissioners for your time today. Uh, basically, uh, when I decided to do this space, my intent was for it to be safe and fun for animals. On the day-to-day -day basis, we're doing roughly anywhere from 20 to 25 dogs in daycare. That includes outdoor, we have pools and misters, that's, and um, you know, bacon flavored bubble machines, you name it. And um, I, I would love for you to consider me to have boarding. Um, we it would be supervised, 100% supervised, cage free. Um, when you think of a kennel, I'm sure you often think, oh, you know, the space is to keep my dog safe and well fed, but our space is different. They, they would be able to play with one another, engage, be social, tired, and most of all, happy and safe. So I appreciate your consideration. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, Commissioner Ingalls. Ms. Kicksmiller, you're looking to have overnight accommodations for these, uh, these clients, correct? Yes. And how many would you accommodate? Um, right now, I have nine suites. So I have nine kennel spaces. And would there be staff on station monitoring their activity? There nine would be. There would be. Because this is an enclosed area. Uh, they have to get out and take care of business or do things that that, that nature and right. so you're prepared to accommodate all of this yeah i have it i have about a 2500 square foot backyard area so you know most of the time during my daycare the dogs are outside weather permitted um so yes we use we utilize that outside space quite often thank you thank you any other questions I'd just like to note that uh, th this was passed by the Planning Commission 7-0, which is historic to begin with. And if the commission goes along with it, that'd be 5-0 that uh, 12 uh, citizens agreed. So it's just something to consider. Historic, anyway. Uh, any other comments, questions? Mr. Nelson. Well, I think this particular location in a commercial area is extremely good because there is a, a uh, grooming service for pets right next door. So I think that it fits into the general uh, what's going on in that area. And I think that that helps both the grooming and this, uh, uh, this pet service also. Thank you. Other comments? All right, then uh, we would be supporting the findings that are on page 67, uh, 367 and 368, or we would be taking issue with one of the findings if we were to vote against it. So I would ask if you do vote against it that you would come up with one of the findings that you cannot agree with, or say that you're supporting the uh, findings 
as recommended. Uh, so if we don't have any questions, uh, we'll call for the vote. I have a motion. I have a motion. Thank you. Mr. Chair, on this historic moment, I would like to make a motion. I move to adopt ordinance 2020-1571 as presented based on the Planning Commission's recommendations, the Community Development Staff Report, uh, the uh, fact that the applicant has met the uh, uh, current uh, findings, and the evidence presented, public comment, and the ability to make all required findings as I just mentioned. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Walsh, a second by Commissioner Nelson. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. Congratulations, gentlemen. You made history. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs> so now we'll move on to item six. I can get it pulled up. Okay. For possible action discussion on possible adoption of ordinance 2020-1570 to amend section 20.668.280 of the Douglas County Code relative to non-residential uses specific standards to revise standards for a hill port in a light industrial zoning district and other properly related matters. Second reading, Mr. Booth for community develop and Harry Norwanski for the applicant. Mr. Booth. Uh, thank you once again, Chairman Penzel uh, and members of the board, Sam Booth for the record. Um, this item here, uh, number six, is a, a, another zoning text amendment similar to the last one that you just heard. A um, little background on this item. Uh, the applicant, as the chairman just read, is Harry Naransky of Helicopter Parts International. In 2014, uh, the applicant applied for and received approval to amend Douglas County Code in a zoning text amendment similar to this to allow a heliport as an accessory use within the light industrial zoning district, uh, subject to a special use permit being approved by the planning commission. Later in 2014, Mr. Naransky applied for and received approval of a special use permit, uh, followed that up with the planning commission and received approval and has since constructed a heliport on his property uh, that he's been utilizing since. Currently within our code, heliports are permitted as a primary use within the A19 zoning district, the FR19 and FR40 zoning district, uh, the RA10 uh, zoning district, the PR, private recreation, and AP airport zoning districts, subject to a special use permit, uh, which requires approval from the planning commission. Um, as, and as an accessory use within the light industrial zoning district. Uh, you can see this called out in our code here uh, uh, currently. Again, this is a, our use table from Douglas County Code. You can see a heliport is listed uh, with an S for special use permit in the light industrial zoning district. So with our definition for a heliport uh, in code, it means any designated area used for landing or taking off of helicopters, including all necessary passenger and cargo facilities, fueling, emergency service facilities, uh, and that this use shall provide proof of having obtained and having maintained, as may be periodically requested by the county, all local, state, and federal permits. Uh, and then uh, additionally to that definition, there are standards A through H here uh, that apply to a heliport, um, uh, that it is accessory to the primary use of the land first and foremost. So you must have an industrial use on the property to be able to have an, a heliport a heliport as an accessory use, um, and that the landing area would be for occasional use only with limited frequency determined by the special use permit. Uh, item D is that the property owner will utilize the heliport and customers would not. Item E is that arrivals and departures would be announced on the radio um, and be determined by the airport manager. Uh, item F being that there will be no commercial flights to and from the facility. Uh, G being that there will be no refueling 
and H that the aircraft will be FAA certified and the, uh, the facility will be operated within FAA standards. What the applicant is proposing uh, today is to strike items D and F from the language that are currently within code. Um, and so that is uh, the requirement that only the property owner, owner use the heliport and customers not, and that there would be no commercial flights from the uh, facility. He's also requesting to strike uh, that there would be no refueling at the facility and revising that to state there would be no storage of fuel at the facility. So as in the staff report, we have a discussion on the findings A through D. Uh, I believe these findings can be made. Uh, those are found in packet pages 383 and 384. Um, if the change is approved, the applicant would also have to apply for, for an amendment to a special use permit. Um, and once again, uh, if anyone else had applied for this, uh, they would still have to go through that special uh, use permit process, go to the planning commission for approval. Um, this item was heard at the planning commission uh, as well uh, two months ago and was approved six to one uh, by the planning commission. Uh, that's all I have for my presentation, Chairman Penzel. Uh, Harry Naransky, the applicant, is also on the line uh, uh, with some comments. Okay, Mr. Naransky. Yes, sir. It's your turn. <laughs> Uh, yes, my application uh, that I'm applying for right now is actually quite minor. Um, the, uh, as you know, with this pandemic, it's really affected a lot of uh, small businesses, including mine. Uh, I have to diversify a little bit so that I can uh, keep my uh, business operational. And uh, now I really need to uh, allow uh, customers to use my helipad. And um, as I mentioned during the earlier meeting, uh, the FAA, who uh, I have a pretty good reputation with, uh, asked to use my helicopter uh, for um, training uh, new pilots and uh, updating uh, current pilots. And uh, obviously, they want to fly out of my facility here. Uh, when they fly, they will arrive and take the helicopter to the Reno area and uh, do their training and then bring it back. So it really doesn't uh, affect uh, too much of the uh, local area. Uh, the other thing is, um, I've been speaking to the um, uh, fire uh, suppression team. And uh, they have helicopters here. Uh, they're very impressed with my hangar and would also like to, on occasion, uh, bring their aircraft into my facility for maintenance. Um, it's not a year-round thing. It's an occasional thing, but anything at this point helps. And it's actually good for um, the county because uh, the helicopters are quite useful with the, the fires and um, the uh, sheriff department also have helicopters, which I've talked to several of them in Reno and surrounding area. So um, that's the majority of hopefully developing a little bit more income here. Um, I've also talked to uh, people that have asked me uh, to use the helicopter uh, to take photographs of the lake or or some real estate property. And uh, I would like to be able to do that. And um, that's about it. Um, my flying has really been reduced after the last uh, several months to almost nothing due to the uh, pandemic. And I need to increase my business. Thank you very much. All right, questions, Mr. Engels. Uh, I'm not opposed to this, but I'm just curious. Uh, doesn't the FAA have something to say about where we have helicopter pads? The FAA has approved this helipad. They have approved 
the uh, drawings for it when I built it. I had it built that way. So the FAA has actually given a, a letter for me to submit to the county saying that they're waiting for um, the county to make their decision and they would issue me um, a certificate. Thank you. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, you must be muted, I can't hear you. Sorry, thank you. Mr. Noreski, um, I'm not opposed to this either. I, uh, uh, I just have a general question. Helicopter Parts International, I mean, that, to me, that means you sell helicopter parts. And if I were a helicopter owner, which I'm not, uh, I would like to fly into your business. Is that correct? Yes. Almost all of my business is done with the uh, Department of Defense. Very little of my uh, uh, business with my part side of it would be uh, local. UPS and FedEx come here daily. Um, DLA at Cherry Point, Defense Logistics Agency, uh, they're one of my customers. Border Patrol back east is one of my customers. I don't even see their aircraft. Okay. But my parts department is registered with uh, the uh, State Department and the government. Thank you. So, Chairman, with your experience flying helicopters in Vietnam, we could call this LZ Minden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and LZ Barbara. Um, <laughs> Mr. Naransky, uh, you have to comply with uh, Part 61 as well as 91? 61, 91, and possibly 135. Yeah. allows me to uh, take off from this facility uh, within a 25 mile radius and land at the same place. Part 135 allows me to take off from this facility and land, let's say, at the Reno airport. That's basically charter operations. In uh, a case like that. But and, and the, is the FISDO still looking at it or are you, you done with all their review? I'm done with all the review. Actually, I flew on Sunday with uh, the uh, one of the chief pilots for for the uh, Reno Fizzle. and and then um, one concern I think that that people have operating off the airfield itself is um, fire safety. Are you going to have fire some kind of fire suppression at the helipad? Yes, all compliant with the uh, FAA standards. Are you going to use halon? Um, that would be one of them, but there's different types. There's electrical and fuel uh, types of fire extinguishers. Have you coordinated with our fire department, the East Fork? Um, no, not yet, but um, I have no problem with that. They know me. It would seem to me that as, as you expand operations, um, there'll be more requirements uh, for crash rescue at the airfield. Um, and it's something that both uh, the airport manager and you operating off the airport would probably want to get involved with, I, I would think. Sure, I have no problem with that, sir. But um, the FAA that come here regularly, um, the, uh, I, I go by their regulations. They're aware of it. Okay, one other thing that kind of bothers me is I understand there was an accident at the airport um, a hel helicopter accident at the airport, and I just learned about it offhand. I think there ought to be a more formal accident um, response plan that where at least the county manager is involved in um, understanding what went on and when it went on, and that uh, the, the county airport manager should be responsible for informing him of those accidents. Um, but that's a separate issue, I think. I am concerned with us uh, putting additional requirements on um, uh, the, the heliport operations. 
we got into trouble with the FAA by putting in a weight limit on our airport. And um, has the, the FAA reviewed our requirements and are they uh, simpatico to them, Mr. Taylor? Um, I think Mr. Naransky has already answered that question. Oh, sorry, Sam Taylor on behalf of Douglas County DA. Uh, he indicated that the FAA has approved all of his plans um, based upon the proposed changes pending the approval of the board. And it's my okay, so they're fine with what that, we have. They're fine with what we have written in code. Yeah, they're fine with our the proposed changes to the code. Yes. I would be comfortable if we got that in writing from them. I, I think we might have it. I think Sam has yeah. that effect. Okay. Okay. Further questions from the board? Seeing none. Is there a motion from the board? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll move to adopt ordinance 2020-1570 as presented based on the Planning Commission's recommendation, community development staff report, the evidence presented, public comment, and the ability to make the required findings. Thank you. And we have a motion by Commissioner Walsh. Is there a second? Second. second. Commissioner Ingalls, thank you. And there's a second by Commissioner Ingalls. Uh, well, uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? No nays. So motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Naransky. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best to be the best community uh, person I can in this uh, county, as always. Fly safely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item seven. Get my glasses, this is a short one. <laughs> Title for possible action discussion with Douglas County Clerk Treasurer Kathy Lewis regarding the November 2020 general election, including possible changes to how the election will be conducted, logistics, anticipated budget and equipment needs to protect safety of voters and poll workers during the coronavirus pandemic. Possible action may include drafting a letter to Secretary of State Barbara Shigevsky to consider modifying how the general election will be conducted in Douglas County to support the efforts of Douglas County Clerk Treasurer and County to ensure uh, voters have access to the vote. This is myself and Kathy Lewis. I was asked to place this on the, the agenda uh, for discussion and um, I, I did talk with uh, Kathy, and since this is her bailiwick, I would prefer to yield to her and Dina, and they're very capable hands in discussion on this subject. Thank you. Ms. Lewis. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I want to um, thank um, Dina. She is taking some much needed vacation, and through the power of Zoom and the internet, has zoomed into our meeting from a campsite in Oregon. So thank you, Dina, for joining us. Um, I just have a couple statements and then open it up for questions. So um, I want to start off, I think the one thing we can all agree on is that we don't know what this fall is going to look like with any kind of certainty. And our responsibility is to plan this election to allow for safe and accessible voting for all voters in Douglas County. So while we're still developing this plan and working it out, I do want to assure the commissioners that our plan includes allowing voters to vote in person at a polling center if they wanna do that. And I'm almost certain that the plan also includes an increase in budget, which we'll bring before you as we work out that plan. We've already started to work with Jennifer Davison about using more county facilities and more county employees to help with the election and also looking at that CARES funding to see if that's um, appropriate to use for um, the election. I believe um, that we have to plan this election as if most voters will vote by mail while also planning this election as if most voters will vote in person, just because we don't know what the fall will look like. So at this time, I don't think it's appropriate. Um, I think it's premature for me to write a letter to the Secretary of State's office as we're still trying to plan this. But um, before I open it up to questions, I want to reiterate 
that our commitment to our voters in Douglas County is to provide a safe and accessible way for voters to vote. And, and, and hopefully in all of it will be the way that they want to vote, vote in person, vote by mail, whatever they, however they want to vote. Um, I want to go through just some numbers to give you an idea of what we're planning um, in the fall and um, before we open it up. Around, around as of June 1st, we had about 38,000 active voters. If we expect a 95% turnout, which we had in 2016, that's 36,000 voters we're expecting to vote in November. To give you an idea, in 2016, when we had the 95% turnout, we had a total of 28,000 voters. So this is another additional 8,000 voters we have to plan for in November, more than we've ever had before. Um, in 18 and 16, we had about 21,000 of those voters vote in person. So if we had 40% of our voters vote by mail, 60% in person, we'd still have 21,000 voters vote in person. And remember in 18 and 16, we had no cleaning protocols. We didn't, have, we didn't clean the machines between voters. We didn't socially distance anybody. We didn't have to worry about any of that. So we're planning on the same number of voters to vote in person as we're used to in the past when we had lines, but now we have other protocols we have to worry about. In addition to that, the other 40% by mail would be about the same number of ballots that we got in the primary. So we have to plan an election like we just had in the primary, which was a great turnout of mail, elect, mail ballots. So we're planning for two full elections either way and how we're going to staff that up and prepare, be prepared for it. But um, I want to use this opportunity to, to um, see what kind of questions you guys have for us to let you and the public know that our plans are for in-person. Um, but we're still working out everything. So open it up for questions. Please. Uh, Commissioner Ingalls. Ms. Lewis, I was looking at the information you provided and uh, can't we find any 9% money? Would you, would you ask me? I'm sorry. Can't we find any 9% money? <laughs> what is 9% money? <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. I was looking at all the <laughs> treasuries and everything we have. Um, okay, aside from that levity, um, and this would be something for Mr. Cates. Is he still? He's not here there. Um, the there he is. money coming from the federal government. I mean, this it apparently this election is being impacted by the virus, possibly. Could we use any of that money that's coming in to offset the expense we're going to incur? I don't know. Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, oh, we are looking at that. We do think we can cover some of the costs of this election with those funds. I don't know if there'll be other funds available from the state. There may be, um, but I think certainly some of this could be uh, eligible for that COVID-19 funds that we're receiving. Thank you. <clears throat> other questions? You know, Kathy, um, one of the reasons I think I was asked to do this was the fact that uh, um, the Secretary of State directed that all votes be mail-in ballots. And uh, I think the legislature is kind of looking in that direction towards what they want done. So this was kind of to support you and the Secretary of State to do exactly what you're talking about, where you would have a combination of mail-in ballots and um, uh, in-person ballots. And if that's the way you wanna go, we wanna support you, or at least I do. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking for the board when they're all right here, but I, I think they could certainly let you know whether or not they, they wanna do that. And I think the question is, do you need a support from us in terms of a letter to the Secretary of State to support what you want done? Um, I, I don't believe at this time. I, I do really appreciate um, the support of the board. And um, I, I always appreciate being able to come to this board and, and talk out ideas, hear concerns and all that. Um, I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We have, you know, a, we're about 120 days out, Dina, from the election, about four months out. So um, 
we're, we're not prepared to write a letter yet. I think when we get ready and if we feel like we need to write a letter, I would be more than happy to come back to this board and, um, and, and seek that support if needed. But, um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to write that letter yet, I should say. Okay, uh, Commissioner Nelson. Yeah, I just wanted to throw my support behind uh, in-person balloting, if, a pos if at all possible, because uh, I think that's what the citizens of Douglas County really want. From, from what I've, the feedback I've gotten. Commissioner Walsh. Yeah, I would echo that comment. I mean, voting in person is an, an American tradition. Um, I can remember when my mother worked on the Board of Elections back in New York for over 50 years. Uh, she, she had to carry these big books that weighed about 400 pounds and look at signatures and stuff. The people didn't mind waiting in line. They, they just thought it was a privilege to vote in person. So I would I'd support anything that you want to do, Kathy. I think, oh, sorry, Commissioner. I'm sorry, Kathy. Go ahead, say what you were gonna say. All right, I was just gonna say, I, um, I, I agree with you guys. I think there needs to be a choice. I think because we don't know what's gonna happen this fall, um, if, um, I think voters need to be given the choice, but they need to know that they can vote at home if something happens or if they need to, but, but we would have in person if they're well enough and it's safe enough, come vote in person. So I, I, I agree. I think having both would be great. What's your feel for the Secretary of State? Is she supporting that? I, I don't necessarily, I don't have a feel. Um, I, I think there's a lot to work out of, of um, the, um, just how it's going to look. And I don't, I don't have a feel either way. And I, I do think that we're all just taking a deep breath right now that we finished the primary, um, a deep short breath before we jump right into the general. Okay, Commissioner Rice. One of the concerns that I have is I, I am aware of the problems that they have in some of the larger jurisdictions. Uh, I won't say Clark County, but um, <laughs> uh, they, they had stacks of uh, ballots sitting on top of uh, community mailboxes because there had been four or five different changes in tenants and uh, all of these ballots got sent to the registered party that used to live there and uh, it created a, a bit of a problem is there any way that we could require people to uh, the ask for a ballot so we can tell that they're still alive and living where they uh, say they are? Or is that- uh, yeah, um, that's it. Um, Go ahead. Um, I was gonna say, um, that, that is how it is currently. People can request to be a, um, to get a mail ballot or they can request to get a mail ballot for one election or permanently. We're looking at options to um, not necessarily do that because if, if we had, let's say 16,000 people um, request that 16,000 pieces of paper that um, we're handling in our office to submit to, to process those requests. And I, and I will be honest with you, my hope, and I'm not sure if we're still working to see if we can do it, is if we can make the delivery method by mail, have everybody receive a ballot, active voters. And I think in Clark County, part of the um, um, issue that you're talking about is they decided to mail to inactive voters. Um, and, I, and I think they've made a commitment that they don't want to do that in November. But only active voters, um, inactive voters can still request and vote, but mail a ballot to active voters. One, it would make it that we're not processing 16,000 pieces of paper, but two, let's say that um, the coronavirus um, flares up or we have a voter that all of a sudden is exposed and can't come into a polling location when they were planning to, they have still an option to vote because they have that mail ballot at home that they could submit. And they're not trying to request it to us at the last minute. We're not trying to get it to them at the last minute. And we're not processing all those requests at the last minute either. So that would be my hope. We're still working to see what we can do. Thank you. Further questions or comments? I have not, not, <laughs> one more, I've more, yeah. more so much to talk about. Um, I just wanna, um, Say, before you guys decide what you're going to do, and um, more of a general statement about the the general election, I, I think every presidential election we talk about it being the biggest and the most important, and it is. Every presidential election, it becomes more and more important, and more and more, uh, it becomes bigger and bigger. And um, so, um, I want to take this opportunity to say that we're going to hear a lot of 
rhetoric in the next couple of months, there's going to be a lot of uneasiness with our voters and our citizens of everything that's going on nationally. I know citizens come and talk to um, you guys as commissioners or anybody else that's listening. I really encourage when they do come talk to you, please direct them to my office. Please let them know that we are available to answer questions. We have, ver we have so many controls in place. That is what we're constantly doing is evaluating our processes, making sure that we're offering accessible voting, but it is it's secure and that everything um, is tied out and we're looking at everything. And so I want, we want to share that. Um, Dina says we're always election nerds. We want to share that with people. We want to make Douglas County citizens um, feel secure and that their vote is counting how they voted. And so please direct citizens to us um, and we're happy to answer any questions for them. That's my, that's my last um, hurrah. But for this meeting. For this meeting. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I wanna thank you uh, for the discussion. Um, I think uh, um, it's been relayed that uh, we support you uh, and what you wanna do. I think that uh, also that I heard the the majority of folks say that they're interested in somehow involving the public in a face-to-face -face vote, uh, which it sounds like is also your intent. Um, I, I would uh, leave this discussion with uh, the balls in your court. If you think it would be necessary and or helpful to have us sign a letter to the Secretary of State or the governor or whoever, uh, I think we're more than willing to support you. Uh, if anybody disagrees with me, please speak up. Uh, but I, I think what we want to do is let you know that we're we're supportive of your efforts and what you've done, and you've proven yourself in the last election. So, from my standpoint, thank you very much. Anybody want to add comments or anything? Your last hurrah is right now. <laughs> Would you like to say anything <laughs> more, Kathy? I am good, and um, I will be before you um, uh, probably, I'm um, definitely again, um, a couple times um, as we plan this election. Thank you and Dina for all your efforts. Thank you, ladies. All right, well, we'll, we'll move on to the last item, which is uh, item nine, I believe, eight. Uh, item eight. Okay, for presentation only, reports, updates from county commission members concerning the various boards and or commissions that they may be a member of or a liaison to or meetings, functions they have attended. Anybody have any reports that they want to share with the group? Commissioner Ingalls? Well, I, I have a question for, uh, Mr. Cates, how's the uh, search going for the IT department? Uh, for the record, uh, Patrick Cates, the uh, recruitment's still open. It closes, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but it closes, I think, in about a week. Um, I've got some time on the schedule to review the applicants. I haven't seen any of them, but I've heard, I have heard that we have quite a bit of response and uh, several applicants. Thank you. Okay, good question. Any other questions, comments, reports? Commissioner Nelson. Yeah, I just wanted to report that the uh, NTCD, the Nevada Tahoe Conservation District, got a $650,000 contract from the state of California. They uh, went to our group to, uh, for some engineering because they feel that uh, the NTCD does a great job of uh, protecting the lake and the engineering they do. So that was a good, good point for them. All right, thank you. Now they're beholden to California. Uh, Mr. Rice. Uh, the uh, groundbreaking for the event center has been changed from the 8th to the 9th in the parking lot of the Mont Blue, and it'll uh, commence at 11 o'clock. And, and a very sad note, 
<clears throat> the uh, wife of Shira, who's a, a longtime advocate for, for Lake Tahoe, uh, passed away this week uh, unexpectedly and suddenly. And uh, uh, Mr. Tashira is, is the uh, chairman of several groups up here at the lake, including the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the uh, um, on many of the commissions uh, in here. So uh, I just want to make you aware of the passing of his wife. Uh, her name is Penny. Uh, our condolences, Dan. Uh, any other comments? All right. Uh, um, if there aren't any, then we'll call for closing public comment. And at this time, public comment will be taken on those items that are within the jurisdiction and control of the Board of Commissioners or those agenda items where public comment has not been already taken. Is public comment open? Do we have any public comment? Mr. Chairman, Amy Poole, for the record, at this time, we do not have any closing public comment. Okay, so it's uh, 301 and we'll uh, go to 306 waiting for public comment. waiting in response to Commissioner Engel's question. The recruitment for the CTO ends on the 10th, a week from tomorrow. Thank you.
for the record, we have received a voicemail. All right, play it. Jim Slade. On item number seven, um, let me just say that I have great faith in Kathy Lewis, our clerk treasurer, and her election staff in securing the, the validity and dependability of our elections here in Douglas County. While we all hope that in-person voting will be allowed, uh, I think it's smart that she prepare for all mail-in voting just in case. Um, back to item number four, the zoning map amendment, I must say I'm baffled by the comments of Deputy DA Ritchie as far as um, the two required readings. His suggestion is that the first reading is just to introduce it, is to publish it in a newspaper to allow everyone to know about it. Well, if I'm not mistaken, that's true of all agenda items, certainly the and agenda action items. I mean, when I look at today's newspaper, for instance, today's record courier, I see the agenda and the action items for the uh, planning commission meeting in 12 days from now. It's not even published online yet, yet there it is in the newspaper. So I don't know what he's talking about because those things are always in the newspaper that allows everyone to know about it. He said that's why there's an introduction there so, and there isn't any debate or discussion on it. Well, any of you that have been there for more than two years, which is three of you, know that that's not the way it used to be. That it used to be debated and discussed on the first reading. So is he just making stuff up? I mean, that makes no sense on either side of it, that it has to be published twice in the newspaper so people will know. Everything else except an ordinance is published once in the newspaper. He doesn't make any point about why an ordinance is twice and then why it's any different there. And to suggest that there's never debate or discussion on the first reading, there always used to be. So nothing changed except the board's way that they want to do it in an attempt to streamline this thing. But I think you're doing it not only in the disinterest of, uh, contrary to the public interest, but contrary to your own interests. Mr. Penzel commented that the will serve letter from Grid wasn't in the packet. Well, no, nothing was in the packet to speak of. Not the 40 pages of maps and commentary and not all the planning commission minutes where they explained why they denied it, not the comments from the applicant saying that it was so his 92 year old mother could live in a senior facility for 20 more years. So she's 112. That's why he needed to make as much money as possible. None of that was in your packet today, but it should be. The minutes should be there. The map should be there. The presentation by the applicant, it should all be in there for you guys. And you're doing yourselves and the public a disfavor by That's the only voicemail we've received, Chairman. Okay, that's 308. So we've uh, waited past the time. Um, any last comments from commissioners? Seeing none, then I'll declare we are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all have a good day and a good week. Happy 4th of July. Happy